Okay, uh, let's do some coding. Uh, we will create something that is known in computational geometry as a convex hull. But when it comes to coding, first things first. Cheers. Uh, I said this before, but I have a course on developing for Rhino in C Sharp and C++ and you will find the links below. There you will find the introduction for free and it will guide you through the process of setting up your plugin and creating a basic, basic so-called Hello World plugin. So you will be easily able to follow what I'm doing now and reproduce it in parallel. So I will not go through that setup here and I will jump straight to coding. I will try to make it clear to you what I'm doing even if you do not have the coding experience and you will immediately see the results of the code. I will not avoid anything. I will create the code from scratch and everything will be shown in this video. So come on inside, it's windy. If you went through one of my courses, you will be able to code uh, something like this on your own without any problems. Of course, you can follow this now even without the course or programming knowledge and you will, you will be able to replicate it completely because I will show everything. Remember the door metaphor? So why convex hull? Well, it is one of the very basic algorithms in computational geometry and the first one I ever programmed for Rhino, I think. It was then in C++ and for Rhino 4. What this algorithm does, it takes a set of random points on a plane and then creates a polyline around them. You can imagine the dots being nails with a rubber band around them, for example. Or columns and the convex hull uh, is a rope or even a floor contour around them. Now this algorithm has a lot of different cool uses, like for example for collision avoidance in robotics or self-driving cars. Or we can imagine it being used for floor plan contours, but more about that in the follow-up video. That means we will program this method now from scratch and actually use it in one of the next videos I am preparing. But I will keep that a secret for now. So, let's go. Okay, so I'll just open up Visual Studio here. When I programmed this for the first time, I think I used an incremental algorithm, which is cool because it can be expanded to three dimensions. But now we will use the most efficient one in 2D called Graham's, uh, Graham's algorithm. So starting a new project, Rhino Common plugin for Rhinoceros. Of course, I will save it on the desktop as every normal person that does live videos does, because I don't want you picking in my computer. Desktop, we select the folder, we'll create the di directory for the solutions and let's call it uh, whatever or in our case convex hull because that's what we're doing. Okay, so it's a general utility plugin. Command sample can stay there. Let's leave it at that. We are rushing, we're speeding through this. So this is the command sample provided by Rhino inside the convex hull, hull command. I go through all of this in my course and in my introductory videos, so I'm not going over it here. And we have an empty command. So one, now when we call this command in Rhino, at the moment not will, will be executed. So let's first go and create the skeleton of what our algorithm will do. So first we will prompt the user to select the points. Then we will uh, check if those uh, points are in order. I will explain in a moment what that means. Then we will actually calculate the convex hull of the points and we will draw the polyline that we calculated. So that's the simple thing and some of the functions will be done here. So I will create new functions inside this uh, command class and for some other cl uh, functions I will create a new class. So I will just simply add a new item. Actually I could have gone to the class but it doesn't matter. I can do it here and I can call it convex hull. That's okay. We're in the same namespace, mm. convex hole, so we'll uh, remain at that. So let's create our first function that will be called just simply select points. And I go through this again in my courses. It's a very simple thing, but we will, uh, from that function, we will simply get a list of 3D points and let's call them input points, okay? Right now there is no function, that's why this is red, but if I click here and go on quick actions, actions and generate the method, I will be uh, getting a new functions here that's called select points. So this is what we will do in that function. We will delete this. We will create a variable that will hold a new get object. And then we will set some geometry filter. 
we will set it to object type uh, point because we want the user to select only points. Uh, we want the user not to select a single point but to be able to select multiple points. So we will set this to one and zero. And if the user selected anything, which means that the command result uh, in this case, we want to cover uh, what happens if the user did not select anything, if the result is not success of his selection, of their selection, then input points will be null and we will return, what do we to return? Nothing because our function is void and doesn't return anything, so we will simply get out of the function. But if everything is all right, then we will start collecting all our points. We will first create a new space in the memory and we will immediately give it a count for this list. We know how many uh, uh, objects we will have, which is the uh, object count of whatever the user selected. And simply we will go for, uh, for every object in that, in that selection. What will we do? We will extract a single point. So go, we find the object, iteration i, and we find its point. Uh, except that this point, sorry, I put i in angular brackets like this. And except that this point that we're getting here is a point, not a point 3D. So if we want a point 3D, we'll have to call its property location and that will give us a 3D point. This all might sound a bit confusing. You can check it out, research it a bit, and I explain it all in my uh, uh, lessons. So now we have this 3D point and now we can input it in our final, final list. And that's it. This function, when once called, will prompt the user to select the points and uh, it will hold all the points in this list. I could test that now, but I'm not going to test it at the moment because we're speeding up. You will see uh, when we uh, test one of the following functions that this one actually works. So what we want to do now is we want to check for some errors, right? Well, let's see. First, let's imagine there is a function called are there errors. And we will pass to that function our points that we just selected, right? And if there are any other errors, we will simply return a result of the command failure. So let's create this function now. There it is created for us. And let's think about what we can check. First thing we can check is if the count of our points is smaller than three, because if we have one or two points or zero, we do not want to deal with it. So if that happens, let's just write to the user. We need at least three points. And we will do what? We will simply return true. Why true? Because if we return true, that means there are errors. And then this will be true. And that means that we will return failure. So are there errors? This will return true. Well, you see that there is here red because it's expecting some default value for return. So let's put a default value of false. So by default, there won't be any errors, hopefully, in this function. And I want to check another thing, uh, not only if the count is less than three, but I want to check if there are duplicates among the points, because if there are duplicates, the algorithm is not going to work that well. So let's imagine another function. Are there duplicates? And again, we are passing our points, right? Uh, and then if there are duplicates, let's copy this. We will say not that we need at least points, but we can say something like error. There are some duplicates. And of course, you can change this into actually de deleting the duplicates for the user. But in our case, we're not going to do that now. Uh, so let's create this function quickly. Are there duplicates? And here it is, empty function. And let me tell you how we're going to do this. So what we will do is we will go through the our whole list of input points. It's going to be a nested for loop. And we will say duplicate 
found it is false. So we will uh, test a single point and then compare all other points in the row uh, with it and then see if anyone matches its position. So it's going to be a nested loop and we're going to start from i plus 1 uh, and we are going to go uh, through all the input points as well. And uh, since I'm going all the way until the end of the array with the J, I want to stop with my I before the last one because I'm going plus one. If I don't go this here, I will go out of the array. If you stop and think about it, it will be logical to you. So what I can say here is I can take my input points of the, with the J iteration, deduct the input point with the A, I iteration and in that way I have a vector and I can check the length of that vector simply and I can check if the length is smaller than some particular value let's say whatever something random like this something small if the if the distance between them is smaller than 0 0.0001 in whatever units you're working then we can say duplicate is found and we can break the for loop we're breaking outside of this for loop, we're landing here, and then we're checking again if the duplicate is found, we can simply return true. Now, this is a bit redundant, right? Because, sorry, I said return true. Because what we want to do is we want to return true immediately when the duplicate is found. So I can delete this and I can say here, the moment we find one duplicate, we can return that. And we don't need this. And we basically simplify, simpli uh, simplify the entire function. So I will repeat shortly here what happens again. So we go for, for all the points and compare them for all the points in front of them. And whenever we find a match, whenever the distance between the two points is smaller than 0 0.001, we return true and say, okay, we found a duplicate. It's still red because uh, we don't have a default return value, so we can say false here. If all these go, uh, if all these points are compared and nothing, uh, no match is found, no duplicate is found, we will simply return false, and there will be no duplicates here and no error. So you can you see here we're done with are there errors function. So as you see, I'm letting this code evolve a bit now. So just before I, I, uh, I test this, I will delete this error here that we need at least point, three points because we are actually I'm not going to delete it. I'm going to leave it for you to decide if you're going to use it or not. But I can go here where I select my points in the function and immediately give it that condition. condition. I can say or if object count is smaller than three, then I will again input uh, return nothing. What is just important here to notice is that if I uh, if something goes wrong here with selecting points, I'm going back, right? But if I go back here, my code just continues going. It doesn't know that something went wrong here, right? So I will have to uh, change the select points to boolean type, and I will want to return something, right? So I will wo I want to return. Uh, true if everything went uh, fine and I want to return false in this case where uh, something went wrong. So then I can exactly like here I can wrap it in an if statement and uh, I can say if, uh, if not select points if not select points it means if something went wrong there then I will return a failure. Okay, so let's test this code. Let's de debug this. And as you may know from my lessons, if we are using or testing for the plugin for the first time, we go into the plugin manager, we have to install it uh, only the first time, of course. And then it's saved this location. Here we have the RHP, we install it. And then we try to uh, call our convex call command, 
select objects. Oops, we don't have any objects. I'll go to the right button. Nothing happens because our error was caught. I will select a couple of them. I will try to call the command again and nothing happens. But what happens if I make a dupli duplicate point and I select them? Here you see error, there are some duplicates. So we see now that we can catch that error of duplicate points, but that's very not important at the moment. We will just continue to uh, calculate our convex hull. Well, for that, we will use this new class, class that I, we made. So we will put our functions there. So imagine, let's imagine immediately, usually work like this backwards. Let's imagine that we get our final polyline. So convex hull will be a polyline around points. Let's call it the result uh, convex hull and it will belong to the class convex hull and let's call the func uh, function calculate ch and of course as always we will pass it input points. So that's what we want to write, uh, a function that we just pass the points and it returns a polyline. Okay, so let's create that function, generate method and once we go to our class we will see that this function was uh, created. Again, the class uh, again the functions were created as a static function, as an internal static function, and in my lessons I uh, explain what that means. I won't go through that here, but we have our calculate. So, this is the algorithm that we're going to use. First, what we want to do is we want to find the lowest and the rightmost point. This is very important for the algorithm because we are going to search for our convex hull in the counterclockwise di direction. And what we want to sh uh, make sure is that the first point is definitely on the uh, on the convex hull. It definitely on the outside boundary, because if the first point is not, then we will have trouble. You can see, you will see later why. So how do we ensure that the first point is really on the outer boundary of all points? Then, well, we you found the lowest one in the y direction, and uh, if there are multiple on the same uh, y. Uh, coordinate then you find the rightmost one so then you're sure that the first point is for sure, uh, at the low at uh, the convex hull afterwards what we will do we will, we will sort the points based on the angle they are making with the positive x axis why is that well i cannot go into the uh, details of the algorithm now you can find it uh, in, in many books i will uh, leave some descriptions below but there is a clear mathematical uh, reason why that works if we sort them by angle how we can then uh, go through them one by one and uh, with a certain test we can find the convex hull and that test is called the graham's algorithm so what we will do is we will uh, we will um, call Graham's Graham let's call it Graham sort and that will sort all the points and create a convex hull uh, once they're all sorted by angle so we will put all these functions here of course uh, this is red because it's search it's asking for some polyline we will give it right now we will say uh, we will give it a generic empty polyline that it's nothing but at the end we will have the result polyline so let's create these three functions let's say find lowest and as always we are just giving them give it our input points so let's call angle sort and let's call this graham graham sort why am i having trouble pronouncing graham okay input points so we will create all these three functions and after we're finished programming them we will have our complete uh, convex hull algorithm when i say complete uh, it's not completely complete <laughs> i will uh, avoid some things i kind of um, minimized it a bit i avoided some parts of the algorithm that i think are not necessary but if you want to have a completely completely robust algorithm that works for any case although i think this one will work for 99.9999 percent of the cases if you want that then i will point out to what i uh, cut out of it so to speak So let us find the lowest point. How are we going to do that? 
well, relatively simple. Let us uh, define our i variable uh, just as an iterator. And then we will find a variable 0 and this will, this will be the index in, in our input point list, uh, in, let's say in, this, in the list of the lowest point. So what we will do is simply iterate uh, through the entire list and whenever we found a point uh, that's lower than the last one we, we examined or the last one that was the lowest, we will uh, update this index to, to keep the index of the point that is the lowest. So how do we test if, uh, if the point that we're examining is lower than the one? Well, first of all, we, we gave it uh, a zero. So we don't need to test the first point. We can easily start at one. And then we can say if input points of the iterator and its y coordinate if its y coordinate is smaller than the point with the index uh, y, uh, point with the index m, then we will simply update our index. It's as simple as that. Once we go through all the points, m will hold the index of the point that is the lowest, right? So there are two things we have to do here. First, uh, I said that it may happen that multiple points have the same y coordinate. In that case, we will want to choose the rightmost point. So let's say, or if it happens that the input, sorry, that the input points y, input points i, and input points m have the same y coordinate, not smaller, but the same. In that case, we will check out if the x coordinate is bigger than the m coordinate. If that's the case, then we will save it. Now, now here we go and always search for the point with the lowest y, and if multiple of them have the lowest y, uh, the same y coordinate, uh, then we will just simply take the one with the largest x coordinate. What happens at the end? What we want to do is take this point that we found and put it in the first place in the array. That's all this function does. Find the lowest point and put it at the zeroth place in the array. For that, we will need to do manual swap. So, how do you swap two things in an array? Well, if you imagine an array of, of elements, you could easily just take two elements and swap them, right? Well, a computer is a sequential machine, is, it does, it does uh, operations one by one, so you would have to imagine doing this swap with one arm. So what would you do if you uh, could do it only with the one arm? You would have to create a third spot. So imagine, or well, actually you don't have to imagine, but what we will do is we will create a temporary point, swap temporary point, and we will give it the value of the point, uh, of the first element in the list. Then we can access the first element of the list and give it the value of our M point. So now at this point, our M got into the first position and now we only have to update the position that was left, left empty by the M and we will give it this value that we set aside. So we just introduced a third position basically and use it, used it to swap these two items. This is a standu standard uh, swapping method in programming and we will use it once again later, I think. So this is it, the find lowest is done. So after this function is called, our array will have the lowest and the rightmost position at the first place. So what we want to do now is now we want to sort all the points according to the angle we are making, they're making with the positive x, y coordinate. So if we imagine this being our points, we want to sort them so that by measuring this angle, they're making with the positive x axis. So what we want is a result like this. So imagine this is our, our, our lower, lowest and the rightmost point that we just got. 
and then the first one would be the one that's uh, making the smallest angle with the positive x-axis which would be this and then this and then this and then this and then this that's the whole idea be uh, behind this angle sort algorithm so that we sort them in this direction okay so let's do that uh, again, I will make two iterators. Uh, you will notice that I do this uh, declaring of the variables uh, uh, i and j as uh, iterators. That's uh, something I picked up in C++. I mean, in C Sharp, you could easily do for each and stuff like for the loop, but that's a peculiarity that I also talk about in my lessons, and uh, you can pick up on that later. So, we start with the first point because as we said, our zeroth point, the first point in the list is already done. We know it, we don't wanna move it. Move it. Uh, it stays there where it is. So we will go through all of the points, except for the first. Uh, this is smaller, okay. And this will be a nested loop. So we will again go starting with the, uh, next point of the one that's examined this is again a classical sorting thing i mean i like to write these sorting algorithms on my own sometimes you don't have them some uh, you don't have to sometimes you can use the uh, ones that are already programmed for you but i like to sort uh, them usually uh, in my own way so what i will do so what this nested algorithm does is basically goes through every point on, on the list i always have to add minus one here and then for every point examines all the point in front of it. So if it examines the point one, then this inner loop will examine all the points that come after one. If, and if some of them has a smaller angle than one, it will swap them with it. So this is, I'm not gonna explain now how these sorting algorithms work, but you can just trust me that it works and you will see that it works and you can uh, research it a bit on your own. So what we need to calculate at this point inside this nested algorithm is uh, the angle first that, that our uh, first point makes with the uh, x-axis. So we will cal calculate the, the angle between the x-axis and between the new vector that we will just create right now and that new vector is between uh, the point that we are currently examining and between the point one, uh, the point, uh, the first point in the array, the point zero. So what basically this is this vector. We always uh, uh, create a vector from point zero to the point that we're examining. These are all vectors that are drawn here. So what, what I calculated here is this first angle and I can copy it now and say angle j it's the same thing only with this second nested point here so this here j goes here and that's it so what do i do here so what i, I simply go here uh, sorry it's not supposed to be capital so i will simply go here and if and i will say if angle j is smaller than angle y i have to do what you already learned that i have to swap them so let me just copy this manual swap here. And uh, of course, what are we swapping here? We're swap swapping uh, input points Y, input points Y, input points J and J. So we're, we're just swapping the, the input point Y and J in case that J angle is smaller than uh, Y. It, it goes into its position. Uh, there is another thing we have to cover, and this is exactly the thing that I'm cutting out of this algorithm. I told you before that this algorithm has to do, uh, uh, has to, it can be a bit more robust. So if you look at a bit in the books, it says that if you have points that have exactly the same angles, like imagine you have a point here, it said exactly the same angle as this point here, then you would have to remove them. So all the points that are here would first have to be removed from the array and then because they can make some problems and then the array should be calculated. I am actually not removing them. What I, I will do, I will check the lengths, I will check the distances from the point zero and I will sort them by putting the, the, the points that are closer to the point zero first. 
so I think that this works uh, as well. So I can say if the absolute value of detecting uh, angle I and angle J is smaller zero zero one. Why am I doing this? Uh, I explained this in my course as well uh, and in my C sharp and C++ course when you have double precision numbers you don't you never want to go uh, with equal I never want to uh, write angle I uh, equals angle J because with double precision numbers uh, they there can always be some very 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 small uh, imperceptible differences and in that case although they're equal they might not be equal so you don't want to do that you always want to deduct them and see if the difference between them is smaller than some threshold so if they're actually the same look under uh, their differences under this threshold then i want to check how far are they from the original point right so let's say length a is input points y minus input points zero and then check the length right that's the that's the distance between the point i and the, and the point zero and this is the distance between the point j and the point zero and i can simply say if length j is smaller than length i which is the case where i want to swap them then i do the swapping again and in this case it's the same i am swapping the point j with the point i so believe it or not our angle sort function is done that means that now when our user has multiple points and simply selects them they will be after this function they will be in the following order they will be actually sorted by angle like this so there is the only one small thing left to do uh, the, the convex hull which is this gram sort and it's uh, not so complicated it evolves one additional function that you will see in a moment and i will explain it right away so some parts of this gram sort of course i'm not going to explain why it is done how it is done i will give you a hint but the point is not now to explain how the algorithm works per se but to see it coded and you can research it on your own so let us create a, a 3d list a list of 3d points let's call it ch and this will be uh, holding our, all of our points of our convex hull what we do know is that we already have the first two points so if you look at here we know that our point is zero point is on the convex hull and because this one the, the first point now sorted creates the smallest angle between it, it and the positive x-axis we also know for sure that is it is on the convex hull so this is where we start with point one uh, zero and point one because we know for sure they are on the border so we will uh, to our final list of points on the convex hull we add these two points and now what we want to do is we will uh, go into a while loop it's a sort of an infinite loop that will happen until uh, all our conditions is fulfilled so what will be our condition so first let's set an iterator uh, i at 2 and then we will say while this iterator is smaller than the count of points so we will simply want to go through all of our points but the reason we are doing it uh, like this because we are not going to go sequentially we will sometimes jump skip go backwards and so on so as you will see what we will what do we want to do here we want to f to determine what the determinant is i hope that's how it's pronounced in english determinant between three points and the points we want to examine is the second point from the back of the list then the last point on the list again 
This is the second point from the back. This is the last point in the list. I explained this in my courses as well. This is simply the count of the list minus one. And I will not elaborate on it why it is like that now. And we want to examine the, the next point, the next candidate. So what is the determinant and what are we doing here? Well, I will let you look at the determinant a little bit on your own, but what we are interested in is this three times three matrix and finding uh, the, the determinant of the three points. You can research it on your own, as I said, but uh, what it does, it's very simple. It tells you when you examine three points, if you're making a left turn or if you're making a right turn. What does that mean? That means that if I have three points, let's say this is my first point, this is my second point, and this is my third point. So this is the, this is the direction of my selection. And if I put their coordinates into the determined formula, it will tell me that if, if the result is positive number, it doesn't matter which number, I will know that these three points are making a left turn or counterclockwise turn. If I select three points like this, zack, 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 and this is the direction of my selection, and I calculate the determinant, it will tell me that they're making a right turn or counterclockwise turn. And this is very important for this algorithm, as you will see in a moment. Actually, not in a moment. I will explain just shortly now. I can't explain it fully how it works. But the point of the algorithm is that it will basically simply test, go, you go uh, analyze these triplets and always try to find a left turn. So the moment there is a right turn, like here, the algorithm knows something went wrong and it has to go backwards and it has to test and test and test until it makes a left turn and then continues making a left turn and no right turn appears. And it, it, that is the way we are going to get this complete convex hull. Now, again, I would have to demonstrate it a little bit longer, so I will leave that research to you, but you can see how whenever we go here in the middle, we will have to, and in the next step, it will happen that we will have a right turn and the algorithm will say, no, 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 that doesn't work. So we have to go back and back until we already only have left turns and that will give, our, uh, give us our convex hull. So let's first determine, uh, calculate this determinant, right? So let's create a function that's a, a determinant and that says uh, three points. And uh, I will not uh, write this now. I will simply copy paste it because I already have it here on the side. And you can look at it on your own. What this function uh, does, I will simply replace these names as inputs. What this function does is here, what you see here, it creates basically three rows. In the first row, there is just one, 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 uh, like, like it says here. And then in the second row is uh, X coordinate of the first point, X coordinate of the second point, X coordinate of the third point, and then Y, Y, Y. And then this little formula here will do what you see on this picture. It will simply create these two new rows uh, of elements. Those are not new rows. As you can see, this is this row just copied here and this row just copied here. And then it will, uh, as you see, it will calculate the sum of the prog pro uh, products along the solid diagonals minus the sum of the products along the dash diagonals. And as a result, it will simply give you like a number 172.5 minus 13.6. And the number doesn't matter at all. What we are only concerned about is if the number is smaller than zero or bigger than zero or zero. That's an also an interesting fact. If your three points are exactly linear, uh, collinear or on the single line, then the determinant will be zero. That is a very interesting algorithm and it's also uh, one that I use a lot in the Voronoi and Voronax uh, plugins that I have made. So, we will see if our determinant is bigger or equal to zero, because if the, uh, if the, co if the points are collinear, we also want to keep them. So if you imagine uh, having a group of points, let's uh, forget these ones for a moment, but let's imagine there is a group of points like here that are collinear here. And our co convex hull goes like this. If, if they are linear, we will want to continue using them. 
Actually, that is the second thing I changed in the algorithm because I wanted to make it shorter so that this video is not very long. So uh, in the original robust algorithm, what you have to do is basically remove all the points that are collinear. So all the points in the middle, because theoretically the convex hull algorithm for a grid like this, this would look something like this. One, two, three, four points, and that's it. And these in the middle would not be included. And in our case, we will have the points included. So basically we'll have the same outline, only it will have a, a larger number of points in the polyline, but, but that's all. So if you want to have this uh, correct, robust convex hull algorithm, you will have to add these two things. So eliminate the points that have the same angle. And uh, during this gram sort, you will have to eliminate the points that are collinear. But as I said, I just wanted to shorten it a little bit. And our algorithm is actually not suffering. It's only slightly different, but it will still work for all of the cases. So how do we use the points? We will simply add it to our list of final points. Sorry. and we will increment the iterator. That's all we do. Of course, the determinant will never be exactly zero because of the tolerances in, in, in CAD programs. So we will do what we did before. We will say if it's bigger than 0 0.0001, give it some threshold. This will still cover the fairly collinear points. Now we say, what if the determinant is smaller than zero? So we have a right turn or what if the count of points and if the count of point is, is, is bigger than two, this is very important. We don't want to remove any points at the beginning of the algorithm because these two points are fixed, fixed. Then we simply remove, remove the last point. How do we find the last point in the list? Well, we'll simply like before access the count minus one. Why is this count minus one? If you don't have experience programming, it's a simple explanation because all lists, all arrays in programming start with zero. So uh, an array that has uh, three elements, those elements are zero, one, and two. So the count is three, but the uh, elements position are zero, one, and two. So if you want to remove the uh, last point, it will be the count minus one. So that's it. This, this removing is, is, is going backwards, what I told you. Remember, if you go and make a left turn here and then make a right turn here, say, oh, no, no, I'm going to go backwards. You will simply remove the last point added and you will start again and start again and start again until you find the proper left turn that can be continued with another left turn. Okay, so this is it. And now we have to uh, finalize this. What I want to do, we don't have to do this, but I want to do it. I will add at the end of our list of, of points, we will add the first point again. Why? Just simply to close the polyline. That's all. We're just adding the first, adding the, the first point, point again to the end of the list just to close the polyline. And we will return this list of points. Except I cannot return the list of points because I want, uh, I want a polyline, right? I forgot to put that here. So I can say, uh, actually, no, I don't want a polyline here. I want a list of 3D points. Let's say CH points, that's it. And I have to put the list of 3D points to be what this uh, function returns, right? So now I return that and now I can put this as an argument here we can create a new polyline just passing a list of points as an argument because a polyline is nothing in computer programming as a list of points. And just before we test it, I think I made a mistake here. I, I said it if it was bigger than uh, 0 0.001, we want it bigger than minus 0 0.001 because we want to cover the cases where uh, the determinant is approximately zero. So those are all the linear cases and you will see in a moment why we want to cover them. And uh, that is it, believe it or not, people. Uh, I said uh, I did make uh, this algorithm a little bit shorter because I didn't check for this uh, duplicate points in the sense the points that have the same angle, uh, eliminate them and so on. But this algorithm should work 
for most of, if not all, of the cases. And that's it. So let's test this on a couple of examples. Okay, so let's start with some random disposition of points. Instead of drawing them all like this, let me copy them around. Of course, it's easier to work with multiple points to see how efficient the algorithm is. Let's go with cell dupe command to see if there are duplicates, no duplicates. Okay, so let's, let's call our convex call command. And as you can see, the uh, algorithm works. It actually found the polyline that encompasses all of the points. Let's try some of the special cases now. Let's imagine some grid like this, which is very, very complicated for the Graham's algorithm, uh, for the, yeah, for generally for the convex hull algorithm. So let us uh, call the command again. And we see that it actually works. And you can now check out and try different uh, dispositions and check if it works for all, all possible uh, options. I think it should, although I kind of uh, minimize the algorithm and cut some parts of it. But I think uh, those shortcuts that I put in the algorithm should work. I can even select all of this and you can see it finds the polyline around them. Or I can select any number of points and it will always find the polyline. And the interesting thing is, as I said, if you imagine, let's delete these curves. If you imagine these being columns and you get wild and you put some additional columns on the side for any reason that you want in the ground floor, and then you want to see how your ground floor or any other floor would look like, you can simply take the convex hull, you can offset it a bit and you can have your uh, ground floor of the building or whatever uh, it is. The point is it's an interesting algorithm and we did it. I know many of you will want the code and I will do you a favor here and not give you the code so that you have to go through this example and write it down yourself. That is how one gets good at programming and that is what will get you to the Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. But I guess very soon I will make a GitHub repository and start posting some of this there. So I'm going to offer you a deal. You subscribe and then you will get notified when that happens. Deal? Stay free. If you want to create your own cool plugins like Voronax or any of our other plugins, I can teach you how to do it. And if you go to proarchitect.teachable.com, you will see already some of the courses there, the Rhino Developer C++ course or the Rhino Developer C Sharp course. Uh, you will get small C++ and C Sharp basic courses with them. And in the future, you will get to see a lot of other courses on similar subjects. You can enroll the, in the course. You can see all the explanation here. You have more than 10 or 11 hours of video. The first couple of videos are free where you can check out if you are able to download the software and create your own plugin. And afterwards, there is a lots of lots of uh, videos explaining all the basics of the development for Rhino so that you can create your own plugin.